Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Retina Roundup. I, Dr. Hainal Javeri, Fellow in Vitreo Retina and Ocular Oncology, bring to you this month's five interesting articles. The first article evaluates the effects of microcurrent electrical stimulation therapy on visual acuity in dry AMD patients. Previous studies have shown that microcurrent prevents photoreceptor loss, stimulates Mueller cells towards neuroregeneration and repair, and produces pro-inflammatory cytokines and lipid mediator expression. This prospective randomized controlled clinical trial included participants with dry AMD with best corrected vision ranging between 20 by 50 to 20 by 200. Patients were randomized in a 3 to 1 manner to receive transpalpebral external microcurrent stimulation with the Macumira device. Four treatments in the first two weeks and two further treatments at week 14 and 26 were given. Change in the visual acuity with ETDRS assessment of number of letters read and contrast sensitivity at week 4 and 30 compared to the initial visit between 43 treatment and 19 sham control participants was done. The number of letters read from baseline in the treatment compared to the sham group was 7.7% at 4 weeks and 10.4% at 30 weeks. There were similar benefits seen with contrast sensitivity. This pilot study of transpalpebral microcurrent demonstrated improved visual measures and is a very encouraging potential treatment for dry AMD. The second study is a randomized controlled trial investigating the benefits and harm of phenofibrate for preventing the development and progression of diabetic retinopathy in type 1 or type 2 DM patients compared with placebo or observation. The primary outcome was progression of diabetic retinopathy broken down into two composite outcomes. First, the incidence of overt retinopathy for participants who did not have diabetic retinopathy at baseline. And second, advancing two or more steps on the ETDRS severity scale for participants who had any DR at baseline based on the evaluation of fundus photographs. Two studies and their eye sub-studies in people with type 2 DM conducted over US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Finland were included. The follow-up period was four to five years. Compared to placebo or observation, phenofibrate showed little to no difference in progression of DR in patients without overt retinopathy at baseline. Those with overt retinopathy found that their DR progressed slowly. Compared to placebo or observation, phenofibrate likely resulted in little to no difference in the incidence of overt retinopathy and the incidence of macular edema. Although severe adverse effects were rare, their occurrence was more so in the phenofibrate-treated patients. Currently, moderate certainty evidence suggests that in a mixed group of people who live with type 2 DM, phenofibrate likely results in little to no difference in the progression of DR. However, in type 2 patients with overt retinopathy, phenofibrate likely reduces the progression. There is no evidence of phenofibrate in people with type 1 DM. More studies with larger sample size and participants are needed. The next study evaluated the functional impact of oral vitamin A supplementation in patients with intermediate age-related macular degeneration with and without reticular pseudodrusin demonstrating dysfunction in dark adaptation. Five patients with AMD and without reticular pseudodrusin and seven with reticular pseudodrusin were supplemented with 16,000 international units of vitamin A palmitate for eight weeks. The rod intercept time improved significantly in the AMD group the dark adaptation cone plateau also significantly improved at 4 and 8 weeks. No other parameters improved in the AMD group and there was no significant improvement in any parameter in the reticular pseudodrusin group despite elevated serum vitamin A levels recorded in both groups after supplementation. So supplementation with 16,000 international units, a lower dose than used in previous studies, partially overcomes the pathophysiologic functional changes in AMD eyes. The lack of improvement in the reticular pseudodrusin group may indicate structural impediments to increasing vitamin A availability in these patients and may reflect the higher variability observed in the functional parameters. So overall, retinol improves retinal function in eyes with age-related macular degeneration, but without reticular pseudodrusin. 
The next study discusses the accuracy of novel intraocular lens calculation formulae, that is the Barrett's Universal 2, Emetropia Verifying Optical, and Kane, versus the conventional formulae, that is Hagis, Hoffer Q, Holiday 1, and SRKT. In patients who underwent pars planar vitrectomy or silicon oil removal combined with cataract surgery, 301 patients were included and divided into four groups according to preoperative diagnosis of silicon oil filled eyes after PPV, epiretinal membrane, primary retinal detachment, and macular hole. The Barrett's Universal 2 exhibited the smallest mean absolute error and median absolute error in total. In patients with retinal detachment, each formulae exhibited the worst refractive outcomes in diverse vitro-retinal pathologies and no difference in accuracy between the seven formulas was seen. For long eyes, the second linear version of the Van Koch adjustment significantly reduced the median absolute error for Holiday 1 and SRK2. In combined surgery, both new and conventional formulae using the Van Koch adjustment demonstrated satisfactory performance, but Barrett's Universal 2 exhibited the best overall performance. However, in patients with RD, all seven formulae showed less favorable performance. The last study explores the trend of ocular manifestations and interleukin during the treatment of vitreoretinal lymphoma and to evaluate the potential effects of different intravitreal schedules on the therapeutic response. 58 eyes of 33 patients were treated with intravitreal methotrexate chemotherapy. A mean of 9 plus minus 3 injections were given. 52 eyes achieved complete remission. Interleukin-10, keratic precipitates, and subretinal lesions correlated well with the course of treatment. Initial injection was given twice weekly and it correlated with a higher rate of complete remission than given once weekly or less frequently. Interleukin-10 levels of more than 50 picogram per ml was a feasible threshold for the detection of ocular relapse with sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 95.1%. In conclusion, keratic precipitates, subretinal lesions, and interleukin-10 could serve as indicators for therapeutic response. Intensive initial administration and adequate injection numbers would help to improve the response and prognosis. That's all for now. See you next month.